Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. This will be a fairly brief talk on Langerhans cell histiocytosis, formerly known as histiocytosis X. I don't know when they changed the name from histiocytosis X. You know, I was in medical school probably about, you know, 10 years ago or so now, and I learned it as histiocytosis X, but when I was doing my research putting this together, um, now we try to avoid that name, and now we just call it Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So either my uh, instructors were teaching it to us wrong, giving us uh, an outdated name, or uh, really the naming convention has changed uh, fairly recently. Now this is going to be really brief. Um, you know, I, I gear my lectures towards the USMLE, and, um, you know, unless you're taking oncology boards as a specialty, which, you know, my lectures are certainly not enough for that, uh, you're not going to need to know a whole lot about Langerhans cell histiocytosis. It's fairly rare. Only about three or 400 cases are diagnosed in the U.S. per year. You may need to know a little bit more if you are going into pediatrics because this is primarily a disease of children. About 75% of cases occur in children. Um, but for board-related purposes, there's only a few things you need to know about this. Really just how to identify it, not so much how to treat it. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can get there by clicking the link below in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner of the video and it should link you up. If you consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a real long way to help keep these videos free. And if you subscribe, you'll have access to some of my premium videos in which I go over case studies, forming differential diagnosis, treatment plan, things that will come in handy for you, both for step three the clinical case scenarios on the USMLE, uh, as well as for clinical practice and uh, putting together a real good formulaic way of going about patients and really uh, impress your attendings. So thank you very much in advance for your consideration and let's dive into Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So the Langerhans cell histiocytosis is uh, often malignant, um, but it's a proliferation of Langerhans cells. Now most of the versions of Langerhans cell histiocytosis, and yes I did say versions, uh, are not deadly. There is one that that is life-threatening. Uh, but for the most part, these are, are fairly benign, but they can be very disfiguring and they can be very problematic and they certainly do need to be treated. Um, but it is a malignant proliferation in most cases and um, they are of the Langerhans cells. So remember the Langerhans cells are those little dendritic cells that are found in the epidermis. Uh, in the middle layers, and they can be hard to identify uh, surrounded by all those keratinocytes, uh, but uh, a lot of times we use special stains if we need to identify them as we're going to see. But these uh, Langerhans cells function as part of the immune system, uh, so they're actually derived from, uh, from white blood cell precursors. Uh, they are antigen presenting cells, so they, they serve as part of your adaptive immune system. Langerhans cell histiocytosis represents a poorly understood spectrum of disorders. And because it's poorly understood, it's a lot less likely to be tested on the USMLE. They'll test you on some really basic facts about Langerhans cell histiocytosis, uh, things that you should be pretty uh, able to, to commit to memory, as we're going to see. Uh, I'll tell you those facts. Uh, this can occur as an, an isolated lesion or with widespread multisystemic involvement, but the most common sites of disease are the skin and bone, and that's why I'm including it here as part of our dermatology talk. Uh, most of the time when this presents, it's going, a lot of the time when it presents, I'd say probably about 30 to 40 percent of the time, uh, it's going to be skin involvement, and then another chunk of that uh, is going to be with bone involvement. It may include some lymphadenopathy and thus can be confused for lymphoma or other malignancy. So if there is lymphadenopathy along with all this, you may be advised to get uh, a lymph node biopsy. Characteristics of all forms of LCH include cells that are functionally immature, and by cells I mean the Langerhans cells that are malignant. These are functionally immature. They're not going to activate uh, any T cells or anything like that. Uh, they, they really are not capable of carrying out the normal responsibilities of Langerhans cells. 
Uh, they do stain positive for two things, CD1A and S100. You'll want to commit that to memory. That's why I boldface that and turn those letters red. You want to remember with Langerhans cell histiocytosis, CD1A and S100. And those uh, are going to be the stains that you'll do, and they'll highlight the Langerhans cells. Also, another way you could be given this is electron microscopy. And there's this presence of these uh, granules called Burbeck granules, which look like little rods or tennis rackets. Um, another way that they can give it to you on the USMLE. That's a very uh, characteristic finding. You're not going to see it in anything else other than Langerhans cell. So uh, that's a way that they could give it to you. They could give you a lot of symptoms. The symptoms of Langerhans cell histiocytosis are pretty nonspecific. Uh, so they're probably not going to ask you to diagnose it without uh, giving you uh, Burbeck granules or uh, CD1A and S100. And I apologize, our neighbor is uh, mowing the lawn. So if you hear some noise in the background, that's what it is. Okay, so some of the variants of Langerhans cell histiocytosis are these syndromes that we don't really use these names anymore. Uh, they don't really classify it like this, but if you've heard these diseases, these are variants of Langerhans cell histiocytosis. The first is Hanschuler Christian disease. This is a multifocal LCH, and it's typically referred to now as multifocal LCH. It occurs in young children, um, you know, at the oldest teenagers, but typically uh, grade school and younger. And it includes a quartet of exophthalmos due to infiltration around the eye, uh, diabetes insipidus due to uh, infiltration of the pituitary, uh, lytic bone lesions, usually of the skull, and recurrent otitis media, all in addition to uh, the rash, uh, which we're going to look at. So this really just infiltrates all over the place, and it's these Langerhans cells that are infiltrating. Um, so look for uh, a kid that is really thirsty, peeing a lot, has a rash, and maybe some pathologic fractures. You get an x-ray of the skull, and you'll see lytic lesions. And that's the most common place for you to find bone lesions, but you can find them elsewhere. Letterer Sui disease is disseminated. Langerhans cell histiocytosis. It's congenital, autosomal recessive, and it typically occurs in infancy up to the age of three. This will present as a generalized skin eruption, very scaly looking lesions, which you can see in the other forms of histiocytosis, uh, anemia, and hepatosplenomegaly. The five-year survival for letter Sui disease is 50%. And then there's another more localized form called eosinophilic granuloma of the bone. This is very localized. It's just in the bone. It's going to present as bony pain and or pathological fracture. Pathological fractures are not common in young people. When we think of pathological fractures, we think of osteoporosis in little old ladies. Uh, so if you have a pathological fracture in a young person, you should definitely x-ray that and then work from there. Um, there's one more called Hashimoto Pritzker disease, but it's another one that's kind of poorly understood, fairly localized and benign. Um, you, you're not responsible for any of these for the USMLE. These are just ways that Langerhans cell histiocytosis can show up. But you will not be asked to, none of these will be answer choices for you. The answer choice will be Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Uh, but these are ways, patterns that, that uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis can show up as. This is uh, a, an algorithm that I found uh, that shows how it can appear clinically and then how it's worked up. And this is really how it is classified now. Uh, single system, multi-system, uh, disseminated, non-disseminated, and, and then treatment. And I am not going to go into treatment on this talk uh, because you will never be asked about it on the USMLE, but if you want to know, it's typically vimblastine and prednisone uh, for systemic uh, in involvement, multi-systemic involvement. So the gross appearance for Langerhans cell histiocytosis is, uh, is that it's typically going to show up in the skin and bones. The skin is going to be a rash, typically papular and scaling in appearance, most frequently found on the scalp. So what might you confuse it in if you see a rash on the scalp of a baby? seborrheic dermatitis. So you may biopsy this. Again, you're going to look for CD1A and S100. More commonly, though, seborrheic dermatitis. 
certainly much, much, much more common than LCH. Uh, you can find it on the skin folds as well as the midline of the trunk. And if you see it elsewhere, you know, that raises your index of suspicion, certainly, um, because in babies, seborrheic dermatitis is typically found only on the scalp. And then in the bones, it's lytic lesions, most commonly on the skull. So here's an example of the rash that you see in Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Notice that it's kind of placky. You've got uh, sort of papules uh, distributed along the trunk. This is really good. It shows you the scaling pattern. Um, and, and, you know, these probably started out, you know, if you're looking kind of here on the right here or on the patient's left, on the patient's right, probably started out like this and then they gradually just kind of moved together to form these uh, this larger lesion and this is going to be dry and really scaly in, in texture so here you see it on the scalp notice how very 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 similar this looks to seborrheic dermatitis and you see it here too there's some of that crusty stuff coming off again seborrheic dermatitis very similar to that so that should be a new differential so now if you're given a picture of this and then they show you a picture of this or they say lytic bone lesions of the skull, uh, then you know you're dealing with histiocytosis because seborrheic dermatitis would never give you this. So here you see lots of lytic lesions of the skull. Not very different from what you'd see in an adult with multiple myeloma. Now microscopically, you're going to see, if uh, on light microscope, you're going to see a diffuse dermal infiltrate of Langerhans cells. And these cells are large and ovoid in appearance. They can be difficult to tell apart from some of the surrounding cells uh, because you can get a pretty large eosinic infiltrate and that can obscure some of the cells on histopathology. Uh, but um, what you will probably be given if you're given a uh, picture on USMLE, and that's really only going to be USMLE step one, they'll probably stain it for CD1A and they'll tell you that. And then you'll see cells that stain positive for CD1A and Langerhand cell is the only thing that's going to do that um, as far as I know and as far as the test goes. So just remember CD1A and S100, but particularly CD1A because S100 you can see in other things. So CD1A. Uh, stains positive for that, and I'll show you a picture. Uh, on electron microscope, you're going to see those Burbeck granules. You have to know what Burbeck granules look like because I imagine they're going to make, if they give you a question on Langerhans cell, they're going to make it really easy for you and they're going to give you Burbeck granules. And it's something that's so easy because Burbeck granules are the, o uh, the only, well, Langerhans cell is the only place you're going to see Burbeck granules. And Burbeck granules are very, very have a very distinct appearance. Uh, so this is, even though Langerhans cell is very, very rare, USMLE step one loves to test rare disorders. And so they're probably going to show you the Burbeck granules. If you're taking step two or three, just no Burbeck granules with Langerhans cell. Uh, you're probably not going to be shown a picture. They might not tell you Burbeck granules. They may tell you tennis racket like inclusions. Okay, so on light microscope, you see some of these sort of almost like kidney bean shaped uh, ovoid um, cells that infiltrate the dermis. That's your Langerhans cells. Remember, Langerhans cells belong in the epidermis, not in the dermis. Here again, now this is with CD1A uh, stain, so this is, this is not melanin. Uh, so CD1A stain, and you see all the Langerhans cells here. These are Burbeck granules, okay? So notice they look like tennis rackets with this long rod and then this kind of circular end. More. And here you see more of like the rod and kind of the tennis racket shape. And that's all you need to know for Langerhans cell histiocytosis. It's a very complex, poorly understood disease process. Um, but uh, the, for the USMLE, for board purposes, I just wanted to keep it pretty straightforward. This is all you need to know. Uh, but uh, it is something that will probably be tested because it's got so many very distinct and unique features to it. And the USMLE loves to throw quiz questions at you like that. If you have any questions, write me a note below. Thank you very much for watching.